Never. Ever. Ever? Ever buy materials for a commission without a deposit or payment in full up front. I had already dropped almost $1,500 on this pair of inch and a half thick, 12 foot long ambrosia maple slabs. Now to be fair, I only have myself to blame. Now I already had a sign quote on a nine foot live edge maple conference table. And then I was asked to quote a matching live edge 12 foot countertop to go in the same room. And I know this client was in a rush for these pieces, so in the interest of time, I had my slab supplier start processing the material and prepping it for pickup. But the quote was higher than the client expected, so I had to make some major price concessions so I didn't lose money. Now, if these were made of, you know, walnut or white oak, materials I use all the time, then I could just put them in inventory and use them for a future build. But two 12-foot ambrosia maple slabs? I mean, what the f would I do with those? I had to make it work. Now, I also paid an upcharge for the boys down at Willard Brothers to flatten these slabs, cut them down the middle, joint the edges, glue them up, and then run it through the belt sander. Now for the conference table slabs, I just had them flatten them. I figured since they were only nine feet long, I would be able to rip those with the track saw, glue them up, and then throw them on the CNC to have the whole table flattened at once. Man, it would be nice to have one of these wide belt sanders in my shop, but it's probably three phase power and I don't even really know what that is. And here are the finished slabs ready for me to load up in the truck. We got the giant 12 foot countertop and the two nine foot slabs for the conference table. And when I needed help loading these, oddly enough, the boys at Willard Brothers were nowhere to be found. Hmm. I kid, of course. I think they ran out of paper in the cash register when they were trying to ring me up, so they were changing roles. Ah, finally got that one in, and then one more to go. What I thought was the alarm for the bulging disc in my back going off was just butt dialing my keys in my pocket. So I got everything loaded, paid my bill, and headed to my buddy Tim and Mike's shop at True Trade Carpentry where they are gracious enough to let me work on these projects in their shop. The first step was to give these nine footers a good long hard look and figure out a game plan in my head. Grab the chalk line, snap a straight line on each one, grab the track saw, and start ripping. Now the client did have specific measurements on this table, which were 109 inches long by 46 inches wide. Now because this tree decided not to grow in a straight line, those dimensions were a little fluid, and I believe they ended up being 46 inches at one end and tapering to about 51 inches at the other end. I did double check with the client on this, and it wasn't a problem. So with those live edges ripped off, I could then cut them to rough length, I won't cut them to finish length until everything's glued up and flat, but I want to get off as much waste here as possible to reduce weight. Now there were countless advantages of working at Tim and Mike's shop, one of them being this giant 16 inch Laguna jointer where we could actually joint the edges of these giant slabs to make a nice perfect glue seam in order to create that seamless glue joint right down the middle and make that joint as invisible as possible. And the track saw wasn't giving me exactly what I wanted right off the blade. And then using a double square, I could mark out for the position of my dominoes, which will help ensure that the top edges of these slabs are in perfect alignment when I glue them up. Now I'm not much of a dancer, but sometimes you gotta live in the moment and feel the flow. Then I could grab the big boy domino and make all my mortises. And yet another advantage of working in Tim and Mike's shop was an extra set of hands. Well, in this case, two extra sets of hands to handle this glue up. And once I had sufficient glue spread and slathered on both glue joints, then we could fold these down and I could slide under here. And then we could fit these two pieces together, get those dominoes to slide in and squeeze those two slabs together and then start clamping. Now, as you can see, I have some clear packing tape across the top. That way, if there's any glue squeeze out, it won't come into contact with the clamp and cause any staining on the wood. So it took several clamps, top and bottom, but I was very happy with the way this thing came together. That joint was tight. And since I sometimes forget how long something's been in the clamps, I put a timestamp on it. Later that afternoon, I was able to take the clamps off and then prep for my little epoxy pour. 
So what I'm doing here is just using some shellac to seal the wood grain and prevent any of that penetrating epoxy from penetrating the grain where I don't want it to. As you can see, there were quite a few bug holes in this thing, you know, it's maple, it's nice and sweet. So I can't really fault the little for having the munchies on this tree. Total boat, baby. And to fill all these little crunch tunnels, I'm using some Total Boat High Performance Epoxy. Now for the Ambrosia Maple countertop, the majority of those holes went all the way through. So I am taping off one entire side. That way any epoxy won't drip through all over the floor. So I'm just using some packing tape here and basically sealing the whole thing. Super fun. And since these slabs were so heavily peppered with worm holes, I'm just shellacking the whole thing before I start pouring epoxy. And then the epoxy, which I'm not gonna bore you with because there was about 468 holes in this thing. Now for the conference table, unfortunately there was a crack on the end grain. So I had to stand this thing up against the wall, grab a little step ladder and make my way all the way up to pour some epoxy in there so that it could penetrate down into that end grain and stabilize that crack. Now, once the epoxy was all dry on the countertop, I could start sanding. But a word of caution, when you try to sand that shellac finish back, you can see it gums up the sander really bad. So I turned to the card scraper to try to get the majority of it off. But man, I really backed myself into a corner with this one. I even used a belt sander and 80 grit, 60 grit. I think the problem was when I mixed up the shellac, it was too Thick. I didn't thin it enough, so it was a very heavy cut. Really penetrated that grain and was like syrup. So lesson learned on that one. And since I only needed the front edge of this countertop to have a live edge, the back edge is going to go up against the wall. I could rip off the live edge off of one side using the track saw. Now trying to find a 12 foot long live edge slab with a perfectly straight edge is pretty near impossible. And at the very end of this slab, it kind of curved in and was probably going to cause me issues when I put this on top of the base cabinets and give me a very uneven overhang. So much so that in the middle of the slab, it would have been a three inch overhang and down near the end, zero. So I decided to try to weave in an angled patch at the end, which would straighten that edge out a little bit more and give me a more even overhang. Now I made a very big mistake at this first attempt which we'll cover in a minute. So first with the track saw at a bevel, I cut that piece off the live edge slab. Then I found a cutoff that matched the grain as close as I could find. And then using the bandsaw, I cut a tapered bevel on my patch. And then I slathered my patch up with plenty of extra glue to cover both surfaces. And then did a little bit of a rub joint to spread it around. And I'm just using some tape here to try to hold it in position. Some of you may realize right now what's going to happen when I go to clamp this thing. First is, as I start to apply pressure, I have two angled surfaces here. It's on a taper and on a bevel. There was really no possible way that this thing was ever going to stay in position once clamping pressure was applied. Well, not without some clamping creativity, of course. I grabbed some straight pieces of white oak, put some packing tape on them so that they wouldn't stick to the glue, clamp those as straight edges so that the piece could not slide down and then i applied some clamping pressure and that seemed to do the trick and once the glue was dry used a jack plane to smooth that surface and get it flush with the rest of the countertop but already at this point i was not liking the look of this patch that maple on the top was a little bit lighter than the adjacent maple and it just wasn't going to work but I continued to humor myself and grab the belt sander to kind of blend in the end of that piece into the live edge of the existing countertop. But in my mind, I knew this was just a practice run because I was going to fix it again. So after a long discerning look at different angles, I decided there was only one thing to do, start over. As I've mentioned, and you've probably noticed, I've been working at my buddy Tim and Mike's much larger shop for this project. This conference table and this 12 foot countertop are just too big for my small shop. But I always have to find a way to keep the commission work rolling in to maintain a steady stream of income. And since I'm a one man operation, if I'm not building, I'm not making money and bills aren't getting paid and these two rascals aren't getting fed. It's a constant rotisserie of work, which means I don't have a lot of downtime or time for important things that we don't always think about, like planning for the future 
or managing and researching investment. I just can't do that much research on anything. Even if a new stream of revenue could change my financial future, eh, I just don't have the time. Some of you work for decades just to see your retirement accounts lose 20% of their value in one year. So the next time you have time, maybe 30 minutes or so, go check out today's sponsor, Masterworks. Now, Masterworks is a team of art nerds and financial analysts who have created a one-of-a-kind database. It takes all the legwork out of investment research because they're not offering you the usual stock, cryptocurrency, or real estate tips. They're giving you access to some of the most lucrative luxury collectibles on the market, contemporary art. In the last year, art prices appreciated by 29% on average per Barron's report on auction sales. That is outpacing other collectibles, most stocks, and real estate properties. So let's say you get a hot stock tip from your friend on a company developing, I don't know, some kind of robot butcher or new way to televise opera. Statistically, chances are that fell through in 2022. But for Masterworks, it was another banner year. They paid out over $25 million in total net returns to their investors. And this is adding to an already impressive track record. So it's no surprise that over 650,000 people have signed up so far, or why the offerings have sold out in just hours. And with the world already prepping for another recession, demand is growing by the day. But my subscribers can get VIP access and skip the wait list by clicking the link in the description below. And thanks to Masterworks for sponsoring this video. But just to give you a look at what my eyes were seeing, it was this. The glue seam wasn't great for starters. The color wasn't great, but I found this other off cut that seemed to match a lot better and gave me a better result. Now I employed a different strategy for this attempt. I changed the track saw to 90 degrees. I'm actually removing more material because I found a larger off cut to patch in. Now the other problem with this patch before was I was going from an inch down to zero. And the problem when you go down to zero is you have a very thin piece of wood that you are trying to blend in and it splinters and you sand right through it. So this time I made a second pass with the track saw about an eighth of an inch in, which will give my patch an eighth of an inch step cut at the end. That way I can butt the patch up to the existing slab and I will just have a nice smooth butt joint there. Unfortunately, there's just no way to avoid it. But once it's all done and sanded and finished, you really won't see it. Then I could position my patch in place where I wanted it and then trace the line underneath, head over to the bandsaw and make that tapered cut as close to my layout line as possible. Then I headed over to the joiner to smooth off all the saw marks and then it was time to glue it up. And once I started spreading glue, I realized I really should have put in a couple of dominoes in this piece, because if I learned anything from the last one, tapered pieces do not like to stay in position when they are clamped. Luckily, Tim could already see my predicament from across the room, and he swept in like the Archangel Gabriel to lend me a helping hand and get this thing secured and in the clamps. But it wasn't without tremendous effort. As we got horizontal pressure on it, it wanted to slide. And since this thing is 12 feet long, we needed to daisy chain a few pipe clamps to give us that length. And this gave us clamping pressure in both directions, preventing it from slipping and sliding away. And once the glue had been given sufficient time to cure, could remove all those clamps and then sand the patch flush, starting with the top surface and then grabbing the belt sander to try to blend that live edge as best as possible. And with the heavy material removal done, I could move on to the random orbital sander, just smooth everything, get rid of any kind of funky stuff in that live edge that might wanna crack off or fall off later, and then move on to the hand sanding to get that edge broken on top and round it over a little bit and get that little butt joint seam blended as best as possible. Then I could trim off a little waste here and flush up that patch on the end and take a look at what we got. It's not bad. It's not perfect, but I think it's pretty good. And I'm not really sure that I could have gotten it looking much better. Now, if you recall me saying before, the overhang in the middle was over three inches. And now we're at inch and three quarter there. And there's the blue chalk line going all the way down to the other end. So it's much more even, and it will look much better when it's sitting on top of the bank of cabinets. Now I could flush up and trim the other end 
to the final length, which was 144 and 7 eighths inches long. And I want to mention again how grateful I am that Tim and Mike from True Trade let me work on these projects and take up real estate in their shop for almost two weeks. So with the countertop mildly prepped, the CNC opened up, so Mike and I were able to slide over the conference table where Tim magically appeared to help us fell this tree onto the bed of the CNC. And here is the animal we will be using from bits and bits to surface this thing. It's got two carbide cutters, which are replaceable. You can also rotate them. It has a two and a half inch cutting diameter. And my goodness, does this thing make a smooth, quiet cut. The cut is so smooth you can see it's glossy in some areas. Almost like it's cutting and polishing the surface at the same time. Now we did flatten one side and flip it over, but I'm not gonna bore you with that. Let's get back to the countertop. I'm just drawing some pencil lines here, which will serve as a guide when I start the sanding process, which was quite lengthy. As I started with 100 grit in both directions, and then I graduated up to 120 and 150. And again, I'm a nice guy. I'm not gonna bore you with that. And once the power sanding was done, it was time to go to the hand sanding and really smooth out all those live edges, get off any rough patches, and also round over that top edge that leads into the live edge so everything was nice and smooth to the touch. And my band-aids look like a candy corn. And then for the up close and personal work, I grabbed some sandpaper and attached it to this sanding pad and using some raking light, just making sure there are no swirl marks anywhere going with the grain and getting everything nice and smooth and ready for finish. Oh, shit. I forgot all about the conference table. <laughs> I went through the same process with this using the random orbital sander with 100 grit, 120, and then 150. And once the bulk of the sanding was done, I could spin this thing like a merry-go-round and trim it to length using the track saw and take a bow there for whatever reason. And then it was hand sanding time, working that live edge, easing that edge over, making sure it's smooth to the touch. I actually kind of enjoy this process. You just unplug, do everything by hand, using your hands to touch and feel and see what's smooth, what isn't. It's a very tactile process. And we can't forget about the raking light and the sanding block, just to check and make sure there are no swirl marks left from the sander. And then it was time for finish. We're gonna be using Sherwin-Williams Sherwood Water White Conversion Varnish. We're gonna put a sealer coat down, which is diluted, and then a coat of gloss, or two coats of gloss, and a coat of satin on the top. Oh yeah, this is nasty shit. So first up is the sealer coat on the bottom. This is diluted, I believe, roughly by 6% or so with butyl acetate, whatever's on the instructions. Again, nasty stuff. Definitely gotta wear a respirator, ventilation, all that stuff. Once the bottom of the conference table was done, we could turn our attention to the bottom of the countertop. And then it was the fun task of flipping everything over, top side up, so we could spray that. And by we, I mean Tim, because he is the experienced gunner. I just watched. And when spraying the top, always spray the edges first, so any overspray gets onto the top and then you're gonna coat right over it anyway with your top coat. Otherwise, if you spray the edges last, you may already get some overspray on the edges, and then when you hit the edges, the overspray will go back on your top coat that is probably already in the process of flashing off. So after the sealer coat was on top and bottom of both, it was time to take a breather. Those flashed off pretty quick in about 30 to 60 minutes, so then with 320 grit, I'm just giving everything a scuff sand, making sure there are no dust snibs or rough spots, I then vacuumed everything and wiped it off with a microfiber cloth as well as a damp rag and then a microfiber cloth again to make sure there are no particulates on the surface. Top coat number one went down just as smooth as the sealer coat. Ooh, that is looking like glass. Now the sealer coat and the first coat are gloss because that is gonna give you the best clarity and the most grain figure coming through the finish. The last coat will be the satin since that has the most matting agents in it, you don't want to use that on every coat because each successive coat will hide the grain and the figure of the wood just a little bit more. Whew. 
And again, I'm not really an Ambrosia Maple fan, but that is looking good. So these slabs now have a sealer coat and two top coats of the Sherwin-Williams conversion varnish. Now, unfortunately, this video has to be released before I get to deliver these slabs, but fortunately, you aren't missing anything. The base for the conference table is being supplied by the client and isn't even built yet, so it's literally going to be carried in and dumped on top of their current table. And the countertop is just gonna be screwed to a bank of cabinets. Boring. Hey, even in Hollywood, they make big action-packed blockbusters that have a horrible ending. But these two videos deliver on their endings if you wanna go check those out. So thanks so much for watching. Like, subscribe, whatever you feel like. We'll see you on the next one.